Hello. Hello and welcome. Thank you for coming today. Today is Indigenous Peoples Day, and I will be talking a little bit about some things that the school is doing Indigenous Peoples Day later on. Um, there are a lot of announcements before we begin, so I will start. We continue here the North Seattle College Art Gallery's virtual visiting artist lecture series that we started two years ago in the fall of 2020. Today, we have the pleasure of a lecture by Hai Wen Lin. I'm Amanda Knowles, the coordinator of the NSC Art Gallery and printmaking and drawing instructor at North Seattle College. I'm pleased to work with Desiree Beadle, who is just starting as the assistant in the gallery. Hi, Desiree. Desiree and Casey Potter Dehan, the 2D tech for the art department, are assisting behind the scenes today here. Uh, we have live transcript available for those of you who want it. Those of you who don't want it or find it distracting can turn it off by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and selecting hide subtitle. I think you might also need to, if you do want it, you will have to go down to the live transcript. It might be under more, but uh, under the live transcript button, you can push show transcript. Uh, use it if you wish, hide it if you wish, but we wanna be sure that we have it for those that need it. So um, first thing is some acknowledgements and I'll start by sharing my screen. First is the land acknowledgement. North Seattle College acknowledges that we occupy the lands of the Coast Salish peoples, the descendants of the first peoples of this region, a people whose cultures endure and are valued. Without this land and these cultures, we would not have access to this gathering, dialogue and learning space. We take this moment to honor and thank the original caretakers of this land their ancestors and their descendants who are still here. We encourage participants here today to consider our responsibilities as we stand in solidarity with the sovereignty, cultural heritage and lives of native indigenous and first nations people. We have a labor acknowledgement. We also pause uh, to recognize and acknowledge the labor that created the United States and from which we all benefit. We remember that our nation is built on the labor of enslaved people who were forcibly brought to the United States from the African continent, and we recognize the continued contribution of their survivors. We acknowledge immigrant labor and recognize that voluntary force and prison labor contribute to the building and ongoing maintenance of our nation. We acknowledge all unpaid caregiving labor. Additionally, we acknowledge the critical importance of the work towards racial equity that continues across this country in response to racial injustice, and generations of structural racism against BIPOC communities. And then the third slide, um, the, the next slide shows what we are doing as we continue to work to go from acknowledgement to deed. We know that it is not enough to just acknowledge the land and labor and have to be sure that we're taking action. We show you here what actions North Seattle College and the NSC Art Department are taking to support BIPOC individuals and institutions and to be held accountable. This slide needs updating, as I know we are all doing more than what is listed here. We recommend Real Rent Duwamish, and we'll put that link in the chat for you to explore. Thank you. Today is Indigenous Peoples Day, and so I announced some Seattle Colleges and Citywide Indigenous Peoples Day events. They are open to all students, faculty, staff, and community members. At 10 a.m. this morning, there was a uh, opening blessing and prayer by beloved elder and UNEA Clear Sky board member, Gerilyn Hamley. From 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. today, we honor our local indigenous communities with the event Celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day, Centering Indigenous Studies in the Humanities, which is a faculty capstone. Uh, at 4 to 5 p.m. today, programming uh, with Urban Native Education Alliance Clear Sky Native Youth Council on the journey of land acknowledgement, action and honoring our Native Indigenous and our First Nations people and their sovereignty, cultural heritage and lives. Thank you. We'll put those in the, there's some links in there uh, in the chat for those of you who are interested in those. The current show at the NSC Art Gallery is a show entitled A Relation of Body to Water. This show touches on the relationships that we all have with water. There is healing and support, as well as a more problematic relationship shown in the included work. Uh, gallery hours have changed just a bit. The gallery is open Monday 
through Thursday, 11 to 5 p.m. and Fridays, 11 to 2 p.m. through the end of the show, which is Friday, November 4th. In two weeks on Tuesday, October 25th from 5 to 6 p.m., we have an in-person event in the NSC Art Gallery. There will be an informal artist talk with five of the local artists included in the show. We hope to see you there. A reminder that the college continues to mandate the campus wellness check-in when you're on campus and encourages the wearing of masks. Uh, we will also continue to have virtual visiting artist lectures. Today is the first of two that we have planned this quarter. On Monday, November 21st, we will have artist Latoya Hobbs speaking with us. Please keep checking in with the gallery on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website to find out who will be talking and when. We urge you to visit our website for links to recordings of all of the talks to date, as well as the list of upcoming uh, visiting artists. We will post those links in our chat. Thank you. And with that, it is finally time to introduce our visiting artist, Hai Wen Lin. It is a pleasure to have Hai Wen here today. I thank my colleague Ling Chun for uh, connecting us. Hai Wen received a bachelor degree in design and psychology from the University of California, Davis, and is currently at graduate student at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where they are working towards a master's in design in fashion, body, and garment. Haiwen Lin is a Chicago-based Taiwanese-American artist whose work explores constructions of the body and its relation to the surrounding environment. They have exhibited at the Pittsburgh Glass Center, San Jose Museum of Quilts and Textiles, the Zong Institute for Contemporary Art, and the Mosesian Center for the Arts. They have performed at the Chicago Cultural Center and MU Gallery. They are a recipient of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago's New Artist Society Scholarship and Oxbow's Leroy Le Neiman Fellowship. I read Hai Wen's beautifully written artist statement here. Hai Wen Lin's practice engages with the construction of diasporic identity through objects, instructions, and systems of measurement as they pertain to gender, culture, and everyday behavior. They are interested in recontextualizing symbols, routines, and customs as forms of art and use this reframing as a means of challenging the arbitrariness in which the societal norms of both art and daily life are delineated. Queerness is frequently employed both as a method of unsettling traditional culture into new forms, as well as a lens for examining how bodies and objects become oriented in disalignment with the world at large. Taoist thought offers Haiwen a, a grounding perspective to resolve the contradictory nature of life. Situated at the intersection of art, craft, and design, Haiwen's work moves through garments, photographs, performance, sound, and printed ephemera with formal inspiration often drawing from their Taiwanese heritage. I will hand you over to Hai Wen, but before I do, I want to let the audience know that we will be taking questions in the chat today. So if questions or comments arise during the talk, please write them in the chat and we will hopefully get to all of them. As usual, we will be sending a transcript of the chat to Hai Wen after the talk. So if you want to comment on the work or their words, please do but you might be specific about what you're commenting on as they will see your words after the talk. But I urge you to support them, their ideas and their work in the chat. Welcome virtually to Seattle and thank you so much for coming to speak with us, Hai Wen. Yay. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm gonna get right into it. Hello everyone. <laughs> so my name is Hai Wen, that's me. Um, and I'm here to read and talk about my work. If I'm lucky, maybe I get to do some listening too. So before I get started, a quick pre thank you to North Seattle College, obviously for having me, for all the help with setting this up. Thank you to my friend Ling for connecting me and for this amazing turnout today. I will try not to be too intimidated, but Time and attention are probably an artist's greatest currencies. And I really, truly thank you all so much for showing up. So this is the piece that I'll be discussing today. It is called Artist Talk. I think artist talks are kind of funny because 
they often ask artists to present themselves and their ideas through media that are often entirely irrelevant to what they actually do in the studio, namely public speaking, writing, and presentation design. Um, they kind of become performances in and of themselves. And I, for one, am very excited to be diving into this medium where all sorts of wild things can happen. Which is to say, what I'm really trying to do here is kind of hopefully break the formality of the structure that we understand to be an artist talk. It's quite frankly a little embarrassing to be like, hello, I'm going to be talking about myself for 30 to 40 minutes. Please enjoy me. I hope we can enjoy this as maybe some form of participatory live art where because you are all present, because you are not watching a recording, to feel free to chat amongst yourselves in the chat box, gossip, send images of things that you think of, react live, flood the chat with emojis, or as Amanda has said, you know, let me know if there are questions or comments along the way. Okay, so a quick who are you speed run. I was born in Urbana, Illinois. My dad is an ecologist and my mom is a science educator. So I spent a lot of time learning about the natural world growing up. And like any good naturalist, I played Pokemon. And eventually we moved to Missouri and then to California where I went to UC Davis to study. So I'm not lying when I tell people that Davis is a farm school. These cows are literally on campus. The school has an incredible veterinary program and an animal science program and an entire college of agricultural studies. I went there to study graphic design. So much of my training or my background, I guess, is actually grounded in book design and artist books. For the last few years, I've actually been living and working as a professional book designer up until I started grad school. And to balance that job, I would often publish and produce books of my own. So heads up, but I'm going to rush through these books, book projects like very quickly. Um, but for those of you who are interested in the book arts or artist books, you know, feel free to scream at me later on and say that you're interested in learning more. But these books were often documentations of, I suppose, like shared experiences. So the 10 Letters Project being a book that I made with my friend Adeline who lives in New Zealand, and where we decided to communicate strictly through snail mail over the course of, I think, 200 days. <laughs> Essentially, we we're sending letters back and forth to each other, and we had established this strict rule system where we each only sent five letters. We were each only allowed to ask two questions per letter. And the recipients had to answer the questions as truthfully as possible. I was publishing maybe one new book a year, this one called 19 Pigs, more or less, a documentation of a series of Chinese New Year dinner parties that I hosted at my home. There was one every weekend for three consecutive weekends and everyone from close friends to acquaintances to even strangers were invited. Participants were fed, but they're also asked to follow specific rules about serving and consuming food. And maybe you can tell by now, but I have a strong interest in instructional work. And then most recently, I published an ordinary anthology, a compendium of ordinary things people submitted to me over the course of a week when COVID-19 had just started. It only just came out this year. It's kind of funny. It's a project about COVID. So it wasn't delayed because of COVID so much as it was I was preparing for grad school. Um, but I love this entry on the back, cold toes, pickled brine, tears, soy sauce, 90 day fiance, very relatable ordinary things in our lives. Okay, so the only reason I want to briefly bring these projects up is because as I compiled this presentation, I found it interesting that I've departed almost entirely from bookmaking and that as many students of graphic design might relate to that, what I knew is that I really wanted to pursue being an artist. And Ultimately, this meme is kind of a lie, though, because I've not entirely divorced myself from design thinking. I'm in the middle of getting a master's of design degree. <laughs> so what do I do now? So I was talking to an artist. Uh, his name is James recently about my work, and he described my work to me as naturally occurring phenomena intersected with gesture. 
connected maybe to an ethos of how light and intervention can be to coalesce with these phenomena, a work that's about a lightness of touch, he said. I think that this is a very, very generous way of saying that occasionally when I'm outside, I like to balance sticks. So I don't know why I do this, but it's something that I've been doing now for a while. And these just happen to be a few that I have photos of. Uh, the photo in the background here is from 2015. These two are from just this last summer. So I've been doing it at least seven years continually. None of these have ever been in a gallery. None of these, I don't, off, I don't even think I post these on Instagram. None of them have any type of artistic ambition in mind. It's honestly just really satisfying to see a big stick hold up another stick sideways. And I'm gonna have 90 other slides that go deeper into my work, but I feel like if you can understand this feeling, you kind of get the gist of what I do. This idea that you have this big thing becoming an extension of your body, feeling the weight of the tree. I kind of think about it like if you've ever had those little plastic grabber claw things as a kid, and suddenly the entire world is within your reach. There's an extension of the body. There are new modes of understanding the world that open up to you. Which is not to say that my practice is about producing universe grabbing toy claws, but that I often produce performative objects that allow my body to understand the world in new ways. So in the last year, I've been thinking a lot about how people come to understand the world around them. I've been loosely working through the ideas introduced by Sarah Ahmed in Queer Phenomenology. In it, Ahmed talks about this idea of orientation. With respect to orientation, meaning how people arrange themselves spatially, orientation as in sexual orientation, how social sexual relations are arranged interpersonally, and orientation meaning the orient or orientalism, as in this idea of otherness, where the, the Occident or the West cannot exist without the East. So this submissive exotic directionality becomes constructed. Sorry to Ahmed if I'm really butchering this. <laughs> but phenomenology is essentially the study of how people interact with the world and take things in with their senses, a study of experiences really. Ahmed is questioning why we orient ourselves towards certain objects versus others or certain genders or certain cultures, so on and so forth. And then the key question being, how do we queer or reconsider the ways in which our orientations are socially constructed? So how do people orient themselves in the world? One way is with tools like compasses that allow you to kind of attune yourself to the world around you. Another being maybe a WikiHow article, because they seem to have an article for everything. But my ancestors didn't have WikiHow, but they did have compasses. So this is an example of an early Chinese compass. The way that they work is that they are ladles made of lodestone, which is a naturally magnetized material, and then placed on a flat metal, often a bronze plate. The ladles would point their handles towards south. And actually in Chinese, the word for compass, jinanzhen, translates literally to pointing south needle. To me, this is in itself is already fascinating because I think it's easy to assume, or as Ahmed might've put it, that our default orientation is to assume that north is this universal orienting direction. So I made one for myself. Unfortunately, my compass is not actually magnetized. It spins and moves freely at will. If you look at these markings on the corners, they might look familiar because the spinner itself reminded me of a game. Yes, so I made a, I made a Twister spinner. Um, and Twister is a game that I really love because it's essentially this idea that there's a chance system that is dictating how our bodies move. And ultimately, I like to think of that as how our bodies operate in society. And with any good spinner, you need a mat to play on. So I made the orientation mat. And this is a space in which people become oriented it's made with a moving blanket and various interior textile design samples. It's informed by feng shui principles and the five elements in Chinese culture that are all kind of 
paired with these directions. So if you have a loose understanding of feng shui, this idea that certain directions channel certain energies and certain elements, south is associated with the element of fire, so it is red, north is associated with water, so it is black, and so on. And so we were ready to play. So the instructions for my game of orientation are similar to what you would expect from a game of Twister, except instead of something like right hand red, you would hear something like right hand southeast. What I soon realized though, was that the mat and compass were somewhat redundant because this idea of orienting oneself felt so much more powerful when I was able to do it just out in space in any room, rather than quickly memorizing that south was, that south was red or that north was black. It became less about a game, but a choreography of actions. Thinking about how our bodies contort in order to fit the frameworks of our world and our bodies. And of course, to complicate this, as with all human relations, I had to introduce a second body. So here it is in its final version, orientation, third score, movement for two. I'm going to play a short excerpt. Left hand. Four jiao. East, so right hand, north, bay. left foot, Zhoshou. southwest, Dong Nan. right foot, Zhoshou. east, Xi bay. right foot, Zhoshou. northwest, Nan. left hand, Yoshou. Northeast, right foot, 左手, north, 东南. So in this version, I have two friends of mine, Azin Haki and Chang Ching Su, recording instructions in both English and Mandarin. The instructions are asynchronous, and for those of you who are bilingual, you might notice that the instructions are also different. So this becomes as much a practice of disorientation as it, as it is as it is orientation. I am only performing the instructions given to me in Chinese. My performance partner, Charlie, is only moving with response to the instructions in English. For people who are born between cultures, for people who are, for children of immigrants, people who exist between genders, how do we parse these often opposing commands that flood our world? Through the practice of this performance, and if you've ever played Twister, you begin to understand how physically taxing it is to orient yourself and how much concentration it takes to actively disregard a dominant language or culture. So all of this orienting business was very tiring, so I made myself a chair. I made this chair because I've been thinking a lot about the directional quality of chairs. I'm currently facing north because of the chair that I'm sitting in. Our world kind of direct us in various capacities. So I made this chair such that you could actually read it. And then I took it out into the world. So in this series of photographs, I'm always facing south. I become a visual compass for you, the viewer, to orient yourself with. If I'm facing south, then which direction are you perceiving me from? And how do you consider your own perception? And I begin to consider the directionality of my entire life. So for the month of February this year, at all waking hours, I begin to take hourly notation of the directions that I'm standing. To standardize this measure, or as a way to put it more poetically, I begin logging the direction of my breath. I was thinking of wind roses, these graphs and charts that map the wind direction and wind strength at various points. This is a wind rose of Chicago near its international airport. And as you can see, there's a tendency for wind to blow towards the west. So which way was I offering my energy or my breath or my chi into the world? So this is my wind rose for the month of February at least. And as it turns out, I'm a very south facing person. And understanding that makes me begin to consider what it might take to entirely reverse that direction. And I also begin to consider that perhaps I'm not a south facing person so much as I am a person who is forcibly oriented south by the architecture and built environment around me. 
I begin to consider how my breath can be translated to sound, if I can begin to associate the directionality of my body with sound. So this is February 3rd's breath data mapped onto musical notes. I use the circle of fifths, so such that the north becomes C, south becomes G flat, east is A, so on and so forth. Um, and this is performed on flute by me. I played flute for like eight years when I was growing up. Shout out to marching band kids. And here it is. <laughs> So that's what February 3rd sounds like. And ultimately, this becomes a performance score. Um, I'll play an excerpt here and then we can talk about it. So essentially, what you're seeing is a performance of tuning, tuning myself to the world and to the wind. So in this piece, each of the cardinal directions have been assigned a note. They're also marked by piles of rice on the ground. And I'm trying to locate each of these directions while blindfolded. And because I'm blindfolded, what then becomes my anchor is this wind blowing from this large fan off to the left that you can see in the photo. And it's positioned exactly on the west side of the room, which then allows me to understand, because of this column of air blowing from the west, where east is, where north is, and where south is, and the directions in between. I was interested in this idea of relative anchors, this idea where people locate themselves in reference to something else. I was thinking about the idea of the body's attunement to the world around us, and how our body can become measuring tools. This is one of my favorite examples. Shout out to the Adler Planetarium for this graphic. Um, but if you place a stick between your thumb and pointer finger and point your fingers west and the stick north, you're able to construct a rough sundial. Or perhaps more familiarly to all of us is this idea that if we're not sure which direction the wind is blowing, you might lick your finger and stick it up into the wind. This idea that our bodies can translate into tools of attunement, tools of measure, and ways of understanding the world. And ultimately, this takes me to kites. So anyone who's talked to me in the last year and a half knows that I've quickly become obsessed with kite making. To me, they're kind of the ultimate toy grabber claws. They can extend your body over 50 feet, 100 feet, 300 feet. You can reach into this vast infiniteness of the sky. It's almost like touching the future while you're standing in the present. And much of this interest in kite making also intersected with my introduction to Taoist thought as both a way of understanding life, but also as a way of understanding my own art practice. There's probably many interpretations to, to this, but to me, Taoism is primarily about having a certain simplicity to life and finding harmony with nature. It's about interconnectedness and the ecology of all the forces, beings, and objects that surround us. This idea that the wind and our breath are actually one and the same, the idea that both are invisible forces that guide the world around us. Kites allowed me to understand this balance, 
how my body and the sky and the land and the wind work in tandem. And kites also humble me. No matter how large your kite, the sky is always an infinite amount of times larger. Here's that same kite down on the ground. And though I've been interested in kites for a long time, it's only been recently that I've, I suppose, formally decided to adopt them into my art practice more seriously. And though they're fun and playful, what lies at the root of much of my kite making, at least early on, was this understanding of my own body as a trans and non-binary person. For most people who explore their gender, or as with many people who are gender expansive, when I was first beginning to explore my gender, clothing and fashion were the first things that I turned to. It's much easier for me now, but early on waltzing into a store and buying a skirt or a dress didn't feel the most comfortable because I was always afraid of being stared at or harassed. So the first few skirts that I made were actually made by myself. I learned pattern making and fashion design through a few of my elective courses in college, and they became new tools for me to understand my own body new ways of literally constructing bodies, and new ways of transforming bodies. What you see here is a pattern for a woman's bodice that has had the chest area repeatedly taken in and slashed and it until it can fit my own bust comfortably. So in fashion design, what's often used to design clothes are these things called blocks or slopers. They're like master copies of a certain size. So you can have like a size four block, a size 10 block, a size high wind block so on and so forth. Um, and say you want a short sleeve shirt, you would trace your sleeve block and then maybe reduce the length or you could make it wider. Theoretically, the point is that anything made from these blocks fit the size that they're designed to. And so I was using these blocks as a formal language to help me understand my body and my processes. Um, but it also, I, I also began to realize how rigid it was as a process. As a trans person, what does it mean to build a body that is in constant flux and motion? Our bodies are constantly undergoing change, but with pattern making, a single number has to be written down. A frame is set, and then a body is built from it. It also reminds me of how transphobic trolls often point to the bone structure of trans women as something that is irreversibly set. How our shoulders are built too, sharp, too big, how our chins might be too sharp. If you don't know what a turf is, I'm happy for you. And I suppose my practice attempts to ask, what if those frames are actually what allow us to fly? So if you were to imagine here, this kite, these lines, these sharp lines in between these parts, they're darts. So if you were to sew them closed, then the shape would actually create a pencil skirt and bodice using blocks that were fit to my body, which is to say that these are actually self-portraits. And when I was making this kite, I was again thinking about the occasions in which maybe perhaps my ancestors would be fl flying kites. I was thinking about Qingming or the Tomb Sweeping Festival in China and Taiwan. Various places, they often fly kites on this day. And I've read that some believe it's because on this day, the gates to the netherworlds are open and the kites are a way of crossing over to this world and sending one's wishes. So I think a lot about this relationship between death and transness, how the language such as someone transitioned, or this person passed, or the idea that trans people have dead names. The idea that so much language surrounding death is also the language used to describe transness. What does it mean to live in this state of in-betweenness? What does it mean to see your own body floating from a distance? What does it mean to perceive yourself from outside your body? The symbols on my kite reference the embroidery and patterning of the yellow emperor's robes. He is a deity that supposedly was able to govern both heaven and earth, to exist between life and death, and between genders. I'm not trying to say that I'm a god, <laughs> but I do enjoy this idea that what, what one adorns themselves with communicates the power and protection, that the body becomes a ceremonial object to be worn, to be flown, and to be displayed. Kites also allow me to pursue another central tenet of Taoism, which is this idea of wu-wei, which I'm loosely translating as inaction or action without action or effortless action, being empty, being still, letting things go. Nothingness, essentially. As an artist, how does one make something without doing anything? The idea that a kite 
can fly simply by virtue of being held. I find that very beautiful. Or that through the use of mirrors, I can bring clouds down into my body. Or to allow the growth of grass and the thriving of bugs and insects on shards of sky. How wind can produce the blueprints of a floor plan. or how the residue of those 300 floor plans can become a painting in and of themselves. How a drop cloth that holds these past actions breathes new life simply by being outlined. In a lot of ways, this method of thinking has freed up my mind. I don't do much instructional work or data-driven work anymore. I move a lot more intuitively, time, passivity, and stillness have become my materials. This summer, I was lucky enough to begin learning more about experimental photography as a way of working with the sunlight to create image. Again, through the simple passing of time, I could capture rocks in a flowing river or growth on the river's edge or straw in the midst of a summer mountain rain. I learned to use leaves as photographic film. I learned how light and chemical could become paint. So this is a process, these are chemigram processes where black and white photosensitive paper are simply exposed outdoor and the developer and fixer are splashed directly onto the paper. So there's no dark room needed for this process. And here's a quilt of 132 chemograms stitched together. Each one was individually processed, often containing traces of the local plants, flowers, grasses, and wildlife. If you haven't been able to make it out, if you follow the lines of the chemograms, you'll begin to see the traces of one of the Buddhist mudras, or in Chinese called Shu Di Yin, the moment when Buddha touches his hand to the earth to call upon it as his witness as he reaches enlightenment. And beyond earth and sky, I've been eager to explore the sea. I've been thinking about flotation as another form of balance. My name, Haiwen, actually translates to ocean listen. Creating these unanchored buoys constructed from reed and leaves gathered in the environment using the language of marking and measuring systems, but floating freely on the lake, as if to say that the mark of interest is the lake itself. I've been thinking again about this relationship of clothing and body, sewing clothes for myself, and then dousing them in photosensitive chemicals, and then simply going for a walk. How do I produce a practice that allows me to record these simple everyday experiences? It's a practice that invites me outdoors when the sun is out a practice that will absorb the presence of my partner by my side as we walk through our neighborhood, where inaction becomes action, when life becomes art. Here's that same romper after my walk. The creases and folds of my body become evident, and you're able to adopt the perspective of the sun and see what it sees. And here it is deconstructed into its individual parts. And here it is bound with a painting. I've been enjoying this process of taking paintings and cutting them up and turning into a tape that binds the edges of my other works. And finally, taking my body out to fly. These videos were taken at Cricket Hill up in Montrose here in the Chicago area.
And I won't say too much, but I'm currently working on a series of garments that kind of works through these same ideas. It's a way of working that asks me to meditate in front of a sunrise or to go on picnics in the park. A slowing down as a way of making. Stillness as a performance of attunement. You catch your back slouching, the steadying of your breath, collecting your wandering thoughts. Balance and attunement require measurement with the body. And I think about how historically the first written account of a kite was its use as a measuring tool. To me, it's a measure of my desires and wishes. When I was a child, we would often write wishes on pieces of paper and send them up the kite line. And if they disappeared when we reeled the kite back in, it meant that our wishes were granted. My advisor often comments that I work better when I think less now. And my work has become looser and in some ways more difficult to talk about. I find myself wanting to say less. I'm not sure that there's an explicit meaning behind every decision. In fact, I find it better when there isn't. My work is no longer about the study of phenomenology, but about phenomenological experiences themselves. This presentation will never give you the same feeling as looking up into the sky and seeing a kite flying. And I also, I, I think about how my friend James also talked about my work as understanding the feeling of a sunset. It's something that is intuitively easy for all of us to know and feel. No one asks you why you love a sunset. And yet you paint a sunset and everyone's like, hmm. <laughs> and graduate school is particularly guilty of this, but discussions about the why and to what end suddenly become raised. And I'm not sure if the last hundred or so slides have done a good job of explaining why I balance sticks. But for the first time this summer, I did put them in a gallery. And I wasn't thinking, damn, imagine all the light interventions I can make on naturally occurring phenomena with this baby. But I was trying to capture a certain presentness of being with the world, of inviting others in, of experiencing the weight of a single leaf. As I said in the beginning, I had no reason or artistic ambition to balance these sticks, but it's often these very actions that we do in life that are the core of our artistic values. For any young artists watching, I encourage you and urge you to lean into these things that you may not consider art at first. All of these things that we experience with our senses out in the world do not have explanatory texts. I think at the end of the day, I'm trying to make these experiences that feel moving and beautiful to people that spark this flash of wonder. If you haven't flown a kite recently, I encourage you to make one or buy one and hold it in your hand, feel the wind, and let the world pull you. There's a feeling in that moment that doesn't need critique or explanation. It is a full body experience. It is simultaneously wish making and wish granting. My partner jokes that if you knew me through my Instagram persona, that you would think that I'm a very serious person that makes capital S serious art. But at the end of the day, I'm writing letters to my friends. I'm balancing sticks. I'm going on walks and flying kites, playing Twister and cooking for my friends. I go on bike rides with my partner. I hike with my family. And over the summer, I canoe with new friends dress up for costume parties. This practice is as much about a shaping of life as it is the shaping of art. And I don't think I need a, a 111 slide presentation to justify or explain why I do those things. Speaking of which, we are here on slide 110. And I hope that I can again bring a certain level of awareness to this idea that even in this moment, across our various Zoom rooms, that we are also sharing in an experience in virtual space. It honestly always feels a bit strange to me how people gather for the purpose of me talking about myself, and I hope I've managed to make it somewhat enjoyable. And now that we've collectively reached slide 110, as the final send-off performance, I want to close with my acknowledgments. Anyone who closely follows my work knows that before the close of all my newsletters I send out, I create a list of shout outs and acknowledgements. They're as specific as names and as casual as the songs I've become obsessed with and the foods that I eat. Shout out to Peanut Butter and Saltines for keeping me going last night. 
So before the close of this presentation, I would also like to perform my gratitude such that you who have graciously given me your time and attention will be honored and burned into public record and transcript as I read and notate your names. So, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Desiree. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Alan. Hello, Ryan, Kara, Christy, Dara, Dash, D, Dijon, Dylan. Thank you, Edith. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Faraday. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Jewelry and Metal Studio. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kelda. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Kyung. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Ling. Thank you, Ling's class. <laughs> Thank you, Lucky. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Okunyi. Thank you, Trin. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Savannah. Thank you, Stacy. You can. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Summer. Thank you, Susie. Is that how I say it? Uh, Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, Yulia. Thank you, my brother, Yingu. Thank you, dad and mom. Did I say mom? I did say mom. And now I'm going to Thank you. That's my talk. Oh my goodness, so amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Look at all that love. There's so much love going on. So good. So my job is to read you some of the questions that came up. It didn't seem like there were many questions, just a lot of love came up during it. So I will, I'll run through just a couple things real quick. Um, and then if you have questions, if you want to put them in the chat now, I, I, before I do, I guess I'm in awe of people who make their everyday experience their art. As an artist myself, I'm always just like, how do you do that? But you, you showed us that so beautifully and thank you for that. So good to have an, a presenter with a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there was a question about the book we put up the link it's all there and i also realized that on your website it there is a list of the things that you are reading correct that we can actually go to which is a really nice uh that's that's a thoughtful uh one. yeah there's um <laughs> i can't guarantee that i've actually read all those texts they're mostly i i it's essentially a running compendium of any text that has ever been recommended to me or any artist that has been recommended to me are in those two links where it says in my bio looking and reading. Oh, I love it. That's so great. Um, I have a listening section that I've not filled out. I think it's like just the Perfume Genius album on there right now. <laughs> um, there's a lot of like quoting you in this, just you'll, you'll see all of this. Um, I love hearing about your relationship to object making as it relates to self making. Yeah, just really, uh, we'll we'll send it to you so that you can see all of the love yeah. that is out there for you. Amazing. 
it's interesting that you like started with with uh, instructional work, which I always think of as really controlling, although in, in a in a kind way, like of course Yoko Ono being like the sort of end point and beginning point of some of that, you know, um, but of course there's more, I always think of it as, as sort of a generous, like, hey, if you'd like, do this, <laughs> right? Like, so, um, but they, yeah. it, it does have a control mechanism to it. Um, and mm -hmm. how then you went into sort of a more passive um, way of working. I don't know if you, I mean, you talked about it. I don't know if you want to say anything. I just, that was something I saw. Yeah, it's actually kind of funny. There's um, one of the book projects that I had published that I didn't share was actually called Seeds of a Grapefruit. So I was kind of directly referencing Ono in a way where for every week for a year, I was writing an instructional poem and performing it. And often these um, instructions or actions were kind of based on everyday actions where I was thinking about things like going for a run or brushing my teeth and how did these instructions kind of formalize that. And I think a lot of my work is kind of, I mean, very largely informed by things like the flexus movement where life and art were kind of being blurred. So I think I think what I was attempting to do with the instruction was kind of to say that, you know, that there is no separation um, between life and art, that through instruction, we are essentially performing life. And I think, I guess what I've moved on from then since is to just focus on the life part, I guess, to, I don't that I don't need to necessarily like tell people that, you know, we're all performing always but instead just being like, here's, here's some things I like doing. <laughs> so good, so good. Stacy says, as a person who is recently starting to doubt the phenomenological experience, uh, subjective feeling and experience, I could regain confidence and faith in the value of personal experience and, in, and the power in it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing your sincere thoughts, feelings, and of course, your wonderful works. Um, I will, will send you this. Is there anybody who um, would like, I'm gonna unpin you for a minute. Um, is there anybody who would like to ask a question or anything live? Is that okay? Or just tell me how you're feeling. <laughs> what What are you guys doing in your everyday life? Or tell me about your experience with heights. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I already said thank you to all of you, but really, <laughs> honestly, I I had no idea how many people were gonna throw, show up. You, I mean, you you told us how to thank, so now everybody's thanking. <laughs> <laughs> This summer I made kites with queer youth at a camp, even though it was raining. And I think so differently oh, on those memories now. Awesome. I love that. Ooh, okay. yes, Kara, go fly your kite. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, when I first started, I think there's some website called My Best Kite or something. I think that's where I just did my first. So if anybody's like interested, like, you can Google like my best kite and then like dowel trash bag kite or something. And there's like, there's a lot of stuff out there for super simple um, kites that you can make out of miscellaneous materials. Like it doesn't have to be a whole engineering problem, though it is, but. <laughs> have you made a whole bunch of kites that just didn't go up or does everything you. Yeah. Okay. To, to be honest, <laughs> the, that, that death kite did not fly the best it had a lot of trouble catching the wind and I like I think I'm quite I'm quite stubborn as a kite maker in that I enjoy making these beautiful objects and then seeing if they'll fly rather than kind of going through this very iterative design process where you might like start with these rough materials see if the flight could pay, like capabilities are are good and then kind of go on to maybe dress it up or make it more beautiful in a more final version it's just like i kind of just go for it and then i kind of pray that they'll go in the air yeah so often honestly i think it's kind of like it's kind of interesting because it's kind of like this balance between 
you know, the desire for flight, but also the desire for beauty. I've been trying to teach myself like jewelry making recently and trying to like sew in small charms and things, but obviously, you know, it's like the price of beauty. It's like, it's lit it literally is, is weight that um, bogs you down in the way. Wonderful. So there's a question which is, uh, will it be difficult to do kite work in the winter and do seasons <laughs> affect your work? <laughs> Not, yeah. Yes, definitely. I'm afraid of winter. Um, <laughs> in Chicago. That's not true. Um, yeah, um, it's kind of funny. There is um, historically, there's this event called, um, I think it's called Kites on Ice. I don't know if they, I think it might be Wisconsin area where they literally like take out giant kites and fly them on the ice in the middle of winter. I think the winds can probably be fine, but more so I'm, I'm concerned about the aspects of my work that um, try to um, work with the sunlight. I think during the winter you get a lot less light and a lot less strong sunlight, but I think it offers also new ways of working with the world that I think would be exciting to explore. Like there's things like ice dyeing where you can put powdered dye on top of ice and then let it naturally melt in, as a way to create image and form. So a lot of these things like I, I my, myself have not tried yet. And I like that I'm living in a place that has like seasons. So there is a certain like noticeable visual passing of time that I'm able to work with. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also thinking about an uh, artist friend of mine who did um, some photography through ice or, you know, some of that, like, mm. you know, uh, embedding things in uh, ice and as it melts, the, the gumbag chromate or, you know, the cyanotype kind of exposes itself in interesting ways. Thank you so much for your time. You know, it's 103. I want to make sure that yeah, that I'm thoughtful about time, but it was absolutely a pleasure to listen to you as you took us through your work and your experience. So thank you so much. Thank you. I would thank you all individually again, but <laughs> I take a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you that showed up. <laughs>